I'm going to demonstrate another program that uses I to A and is an actual complete runnable program. So the very first thing I'm going to do is uh, declare a global variable called start. Um, every program runs when it first start begins the symbol it jumps to is called underscore start. So I have to define that and export it so that uh, the operating system will know it again. I'm also going to be referencing I to A because I'm going to be using it, so I'm saying that it's extern, so I can load it from, um, I can access it from the external file. That's kind of the flip side of global. Global allows other programs to use your symbol. Extern allows you to use symbols to find elsewhere. So I'm going to create a data section this time, uh, some, data, some code in the data segment. So if the text segment is where code goes, data is where initialized data sits. There's also the BSS segment, uh, not a very artful name, but it's where you would set up buffers and other data that doesn't actually have an initialized value to begin with. It's just where uh, you need to reserve some space, and those are separated out. So here in my data segment, first I'm just going to define a couple of constants that we'll see uh, a little bit later. So I'm going to say syswrite is equal to 1, sysexit is equal to 60, uh, standard out is equal to 1, and n I'm going to store as a, a piece of data. So I'm going to say dq, that means data, and then q is for quad word, which is the name we use for 64 bit values. And so I'll say 9283746, just a random number there. Uh, when referencing things in x86 assembly language, usually, usually use the suffix b to represent a byte w to represent a word, which means 16 bits, because that's what the machine size was back in the 70s when, when x86 began. Then for a 32-bit value, we use d for double word, so it's double the size of the original machines. And then on 64-bit machines, for 64-bit values, we use q for quad word. So those are just uh, mnemonics that you have to remember when referencing data. So here, to set aside, to, to create an initialized piece of data, I'm actually setting aside 8 bytes of memory and pre-initializing it with this value. I say dq for data in quad words. If I did something like this, uh, added a comma and a 52 after it, that would give me a second quad word. So this would actually store two values in memory, one after another. And then the label n at the beginning is going to be the address of, the first, of where the first item is stored. But I don't need two. I just need one. So now I'm going to start my text segment, and we'll see what those values are all for in a little bit. Section.text, <clears throat> and I label it underscore start, because that's where I want the program to begin. So this is running from scratch. This is something that's happening. Um, the operating system actually launches the code here. I'm not being called by another function. So I'm first going to put a comment uh, just to indicate kind of what I'm doing, a high-level statement about what's coming up. And what I'm going to do is call a, um, a to i to, um, to convert the number n, that 9283746, into ASCII. And so I'm going to write this like it's a C function call. I'm going to store the result in R8. So I'll say R8 equals a to i of n comma buffer. That's what I'm hoping to achieve. So I set up the call. I move RDI comma buffer. And if you look, I've forgotten buffer doesn't exist. So I'm just going to detour for a minute. We'll go up. I'm going to create a separate section here for .bss. So we have our data section, we have our text section. I'm going to create a BSS section. And I'm going to create a buffer, some buffer space here. And the mnemonic I'm using, the, the keyword here is resb, and that means reserve space in bytes. So just like I had data in quad words, I'm reserving space in bytes. I'm just going to set aside 100 bytes. That should be plenty. So the difference between res and d is that d has you actually specify values and it stores those values in memory. For res, I'm just setting aside 100 bytes of buffer space. And one important difference is that when I compile this and link it, the file on disk will not have these 100 blank bytes. It'll just tell it, when you load it into memory, set aside an additional 100 bytes uh, for what I've labeled buffer, whereas the data segment data actually has to be stored in the file and loaded into memory. So now I'm going to go back down to my, um, to my main code. So I copied the buffer address into RDI. I'm going to copy the value of n into R8 
RSI. So I'm going to put n inside parentheses, or in square brackets, excuse me, because n is the address where I stored the value that I want to print. So I want to go and fetch the value itself into the RSI register as I prepare this function call. So I wanted to demonstrate both. If I had um, made n another EQU statement, I would have left the square brackets off. And then it would actually embed the value in the instruction, in the move instruction itself. Whereas now I'm storing it in memory and I'm loading the value from memory into the register. So then I do call ipe a, which is the function we've already seen. So that should have written the value, the text uh, representation of my number n into the buffer and it should have returned the number of bytes that were written. So I'm just going to copy that value, the number of bytes written, into R8, uh, as my comment indicates. Now I'm going to print this to the console, which means I want to append a new line on it, because it'll just look better. So I'm just going to put a comment to that effect. And a new line is ASCII character 10. So I'm just going to copy a 10 into AL, because uh, I only want one byte, and AL is a convenient way to, to grab one byte. And then I'm going to move that, I'm going to copy that to the end of the buffer. So I'm going to move square bracket buffer plus R8. So that's the beginning of the buffer plus the number of bytes I've already written, or that I to A wrote. And I'm going to copy the value that's in the register AL into that location. So it's going to copy a new line on there. And then I will increment R8 to indicate that I've written one more byte. So every time I add something to the buffer, I just increment my counter. Um, Okay, so now it's time to set up a write system call. This is what I want to do. I want to write, uh, and this is an operating system call. I want to write to standard out, which is the console. I want to write from my buffer, and I'm going to do a certain number of bytes. So I, prepare, I start by preparing this by making it look just like a regular function call. So my register order is RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, R9. I'm going to use the first three of those. So I'm moving to RDI, the value standard out. This is one of these values I defined. I defined it up in my data section. It doesn't actually need to be there because it's just a constant. There is no actual data. But I've defined that as a constant one. And this is just a Unix standard. Um, when you refer to files, you have what you call a file descriptor, which is just a small non-negative integer value that represents a particular open file. And when a program is first run, it has three that are open for it. 0 is standard in, that's usually the keyboard, 1 is standard out, that's the console, and 2 is standard error, which is usually also the console, but they behave a little differently. So I know that because I understand Unix, but it's still, I don't want to put mysterious numbers like 1 in there. In fact, I'm going to improve my code a little bit here too, and define a new line as 10 and get rid of that magic number. There, now when I move um, a new line into AL, I, I'm actually doing a name value. So I'm moving the number 1 into RDI, but I'm doing it with a label so that it's a little easier to read later. I'll copy, uh, let's see, my buffer location into RSI. Oops, got a typo there. And then I need to uh, copy the number of bytes to write into RDX, because that's what the system call expects. So I move R8 into RDX. And then this is where it gets different from a regular function call. I need to move the system call number into RAX. And I happen to know that the system call for write is number one. So I move that, that value into RAX. And then instead of issuing a call instruction, I say syscall, which actually turns control over to the operating system. The operating system looks at my register values, does the work on my behalf, and returns. This is a little different. The calling convention is a little different than regular functions. Uh, the operating system doesn't trash as many variables as a regular function will. So I'm, I'm safe using R8. I left a value in there, and I actually know that it will be preserved across the system call. Uh, normally, if I was calling a regular function, R8 would not be a safe place to store it. Uh, so that performs the system call. Now, this will return a value in RAX, just like a regular function call. But I'm going to ignore that value for now, just, just to make this simple. I should check it. If the value is negative, it, mean, it means that an error occurred. But all I would do if there was an error is exit, and that's what I'm going to do anyway right now. So for this example, we're just going to skip the error checking and just immediately return. And what I'm going to do is issue an exit system call, and I'm going to return the number of bytes that I wrote uh, that were written to the console, just so I can um, demonstrate one more thing. So I'm doing an exit system call, which takes some 
return value as its parameter. Zero means success. If your program exits successfully, it should always exit with code zero. But again, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to copy R8 into it. And then RAX, uh, I copy the system call number, which is sysexit, the one I defined up earlier, uh, the number 60. And then I issue the system call. The exit system call never returns. Uh, that actually, that's how a program ends, is through the exit system call. So I have a complete program there now. It is going to reference uh, I to A, the program of the code we wrote earlier, so it's using that. Uh, but this is one that can, uh, this new code is code that can actually uh, execute. So I'm going to save it. Uh, I'm going to open a console here. Oops. And I'm going to assemble these two files. So NASM um, is my main command, minus F, ELF64. That tells that I want it to assemble 64-bit code. And ELF stands for the extensible linking format or something like that. That's the binary format that uh, Linux expects. Minus G means I want to include debugging symbols. I'm probably not going to use them right now, but it's almost always a good idea to have those there. Minus capital F dwarf tells it to use the dwarf debugging format, which is what our debugger understands. And then finally, the name of the, the program, the assembly file that I actually want to assemble, i to a.asm, and it succeeded. I'm just going to head up arrow to, to go to this other one that we just created called i to a.main.asm, or i to a.main.asm. And it assembles successfully as well. So uh, if I look, I've now created two .o files, one for each .asm ASM input file. So what I, the, to, to actually run this, I've got to link these together into a single executable. So I have one more step. And that's pretty simple. I just say ld star .o, or I could have typed out the names of the two files uh, explicitly. But ld is the linker. And so it, that takes those two partial programs and links them together into one complete program. And it will create an output file called a.out. I could also specify I wanted it to, call it to be something else, but I'm just going to stick with the default for now. So now I should be able to run that a.out. And look, it prints my number to the screen. And immediately after I've executed it, I can also check the return value, the value that was passed to exit, by saying echo dollar sign question mark. And that prints out the number 8 which if we count the digits up here, we've got seven digits and a new line character. That is the correct length of the buffer uh, after I to A completed and I added the new line. So you can always check. So an easy way to um, get some value from your program back out to the outside world is just to do an exit system call and pass that value as your parameter. And then when you run it from the shell, you can do this echo dollar question mark and see what value it reports to find out what the exit status code from your program was. One challenge in assembly language is it's difficult to communicate because you've got to do system calls and it's kind of a lot of work to print a value. Um, so that's one thing you can do to just slip a, a very simple value out. One thing I do is whenever I check for errors, I use a different exit status code for an, every error that I detect. And then if something goes wrong, I could just go and check what that status was and then I know I can look that number up and find out uh, where in my source code I exited with that number. Um, I'll show you how to generate a file with your preferred name. You do the same command, ld, but you say minus lowercase o and the name that you want to use. So I'll say i to a, and I'll type both of the names out this time. i to a dot o and i to a main dot o. And when I assemble those, or uh, link those, excuse me, now there's a program called i to a that I can execute that does exactly the same as what we saw before.